I would like to give thanks to the ancestors, known and unknown, those who have paved the way for us to survive this moment of time and to have a reference point to use as a blueprint to deal with these hellish times we are living in. I would also like to give honor and reverence to the woman of the universe for your superior work, for bringing forth the spiritual information through the triple stage of darkness of your womb and giving birth to God. We would like to give reverence to the universe and praises to the indigenous. My name is Raheem Shabazz, and this is Necessary Blackness Podcast. Necessary Blackness Podcast, every Wednesday at 6 p.m. with award-winning journalist and filmmaker Raheem Shabazz. This podcast is only for those who are unapologetic because the mind of the conscious man or woman recognizes no monopoly on truth. Truth is relative and always to be sought. Hey, Atlanta, have you heard? True Laundry Detergent is now offering free shipping in the Atlanta area. Just text the word TRUE to 404-493-0523 or give us a call. That's 404-493-0523. True Detergent is four times concentrated and perfect for those HE washers. Just one ounce removes dirt, brightens fabrics, and leaves each load with a clean, fresh scent. Best of all, True contains no animal products, and it's safe for sensitive skin. Follow us on social media, True Detergent ATL. Award-winning producer Raheem Shabazz continues the Elementary Genocide documentary series with the School to Prison Pipeline. That film exposes the social engineering done to African-American children in the school system. And his other film, Elementary Genocide 2, The Board of Education versus The Board of Incarceration, takes an even deeper look at the history of the American school system and how it was made to justify subjugating black Americans. These films are on track to be the most discussed films in black America. These films feature people like Dr. Boyce Watkins, Dr. Francis Kretz Welsing, and many, many more. The documentary is available right now at elementarygenocide.com. That's elementarygenocide.com. Peace and power, black family. This is your host, Raheem Shabazz, and I am here with Malik Wade, who is a mentor, author, and entrepreneur. And we are here to talk about his book that's titled Pressure from FBI Fugitive to Freedom. Now, let me give you a few words on who Malik is. Malik Wade was born and raised in low-income housing in San Francisco, California during the 80s at the peak of the crack cocaine epidemic that swept through America's inner city. Malik was a good student and superior athlete, but his life would change forever when he sold his first crack rock of cocaine at the age of 15. Over the next two decades, Malik would experience a turbulent, yet amazingly personal transformation. Malik is a leading voice for our youth and is currently spearheading a national youth mentoring movement to help save the lives of young people in inner cities and unprivileged communities. Malik Wade is a mentor, author, and entrepreneur and thought leader whose story of personal transformation has motivated and inspired many others. This is Necessary Blackness Podcast, and we would like to welcome Malik. How you doing, brother? One love, family. All right, Malik, I want to get right into it. I don't want to waste no time. Now, this book, I did not have the opportunity to read it in its entirety, but I did read the foreword. I read a couple of pages, and one thing that I do know from your website and hearing about your personal transformation is that you have a story that may begin with a book, but that should end up with a movie. For those that don't know Malik Wade, tell us who Malik Wade is today and What was your life like that led you to be incarcerated and how you made that transformation? Well, uh, I was born and raised in San Francisco and uh, around the age of 15, I made the conscious decision to start selling drugs. 
By the time I had graduated from high school, I was being investigated by the FBI. A couple of years removed from high school, I was actually indicted by the FBI. They were seeking a life sentence. So as a result of them seeking a life sentence, I got scared and I fled the country. I wound up being on the FBI's wanted list for seven years. When I came back to the United States, I was ultimately arrested and I immediately pled guilty my first day in court to 15 years in federal prison. I went to federal prison. Uh, I immediately reshifted my paradigm because I knew that once I got out of prison, the next time that if I would have gotten in trouble again, I would have been, I would have got a life sentence right off the bat. So uh, I went to federal prison, read and studied and totally immersed myself in education. I studied for 10 to 12 hours every day, seven days a week. I got out of prison approximately five years ago. When I got out, I hit the ground running. I, uh, I went back into my community. I started to speak at elementary schools, high schools, junior high schools, and juvenile halls. During that time, I was blessed to get accepted into a special program at Stanford Law School called Project Remade, which is a pro it's, it's an entrepreneurship program for people who had been incarcerated. Also, during that time, I was able to uh, help co-facilitate a class at UC Berkeley called Black and Male in America. This was this all took place around my first year of, of being released. But while I was doing that, uh, one of the most important things I was also doing was establishing a nonprofit organization. The name of the nonprofit is SIG, which stands for the Scholastic Interest Group. SIG is a mentoring program for at risk youth, obviously, you know, primarily African American boys in the neighbor, you know, in the inner cities. Um, it's a mentoring program where I used athletics as a vehicle to engage you know, uh, young brothers in the community. Once I have them engaged, I can introduce them to the autobiography of Malcolm X, other literature, different experiences, such as taking them on college trips, internships, and job placement. So the book pretty much encapsulates that entire experience of me going from a 15-year-old drug dealer, uh, being caught, being arrested on gun possession uh, four time, four separate times, pleading guilty to the 15 years in federal prison, leaving the country, the FBI's most wanted list for seven years. But the personal transformation is, I think, the most pivotal part of the book where it talks about the metamorphosis that came about as a result of steadfast study, meditation, and reading. So today, I'm in the community of San Francisco, I'm working with young brothers in the community um, on the front line as far as uh, being active and being an advocate for young brothers in the community. And um, I'm here today with you. And, and I thank you for the opportunity, brother. One thing that I will continue to do is highlight those that I consider returning citizens because we are not convicts. We are not criminals. We just got caught for the crime that we did. Many of y'all have not got caught. And as Malcolm X said, that if you was born in America, you was already in jail. You was born in jail because this is a jail within itself. Some of us was behind bars and some of us are behind invisible bars. But you was able to transform yourself and now you're doing mentorship. And in chapter 26, I'm going to read an excerpt where it says, can you give me $100,000? No, but I can make a donation of 25000 as soon as I have the lawyer finalize the paperwork. Then I can try to help you raise the other 75000 that you need later. I am meeting with one of my mentors, Uncle Pete. We casually munch on hamburgers and fries while checking out the San Francisco Giant baseball game. He just agreed to give me $25,000 to start my mentoring program for at-risk youth. I call it Scholastic Interest Group. And that's what you was uh, explaining earlier about your mentorship program. Now, coming out of jail, wanting to start this program, and you had someone that was agreeing to assist you with it. Was that particularly hard for you to do or did you have like a business plan? Did you have everything? Because a lot of people want to start programs and they never get off the ground. And it seems like yours is doing 
A lot of work is being recognized all over the internet. I read articles on it. What are some of the key steps that you had to take to make sure that this program is sustainable and is doing what it is today? Well, first, I'd like to say thought is the cause of it all. So the um, the nonprofit came about as a result of meticulous and methodical planning while I was in prison. So when I got out, a lot of people, you know, they tell me, oh, Brother Malik, you're doing good. And I tell them, I'm doing okay, brother, but I have diligently um cultivated a plan you know for over a decade in prison i say my last 10 years in prison i'm i worked on my plan every day so what i'm doing now is not by it's not haphazard or it's not by happenstance it came as a result of me planning it came as a result of me in prison reading finding out who i needed to contact once i got out of prison finding out um, what programs I needed to study once I got out of prison. So once I got out of prison, I knew exactly what I needed to do. I knew exactly who I needed to contact. And I knew exactly how I would raise the money to start the program. My next question to you is, as a returning citizen, what was the most prescient issue you had faced upon being released? And how was you able to overcome that? Well, obviously being gone for such an extended time uh, you you're under very intense supervision by the federal government so you know when you get out of federal prison you are on federal probation which is essentially parole it's the same thing if you violate you go right back to prison so getting out and dealing with the constraints not being physically confined but being with dealing with the constraints of having a probation officer you know as soon as you get out of prison you have to pretty much check in every day for an extended amount of time. So, you know, being able to overcome that and and transition back into society was a slow uh, and gradual process, but I've been able to overcome that as an obstacle. I want to talk a little bit about your mentoring program, Scholastic Interest Group. What are some of the accomplishments that the program has had thus far, and how can individuals contact you if they may want to be uh, uh, involved in this program? Well, two of the things that I like to uh, consider accomplishments to a certain extent, although I'm very particular about using that word because in the spirit of Malcolm and Marcus, I don't want to take any credit. Um, I'm very reticent to take credit for certain things. However, two things that I've been able to do, I've been able to take a group of young men for the last couple of years on a uh, college tour to visit five different colleges. And, uh, you know, the, the you know, it's pretty ex- it's pretty expensive raising the money to take 15 young men on an all expenses paid college tour. So I've been able to do that. And in April of this year, a few months ago, I was able to escort 14 young people from the inner city of San Francisco to Accra, Ghana. Um, I was able to collaborate with another program called Operation Genesis, where they did the bulk of the work. However, I was able to arrange for a couple of kids in my program to be able to attend that trip to Accra, Ghana as well. So I'd like to say that those two things um, I feel really good about. Now, me being from Harlem, I joke with people all the time, and sometimes it's not in a joking manner where I tell them many of them haven't been past 110th Street. Now, to take inner-city kids from San Francisco and to take them to Ghana is one of those aha moments. What is the reaction from these inner-city kids when you take them back to the motherland and they're able to connect with their roots? Well, you know, I could use a lot of different adjectives, and they may sound like cliches, but when you go back to... Ghana, it's a very welcoming experience. And the young folks, they loved it. Some of them didn't want to leave. Some of them had uh, not even, not breakdowns, but some of them got very emotional because some of them really understood the magnitude and they really understood how that trip could actually shift their paradigm. So, you know, some of them got, it was like a cathartic, it was therapeutic for them. 
just like it was therapeutic for me and the other adults who were chaperones. But the young folks really, really loved it, and they really uh, showed a great appreciation for it. Now, I know that SIG is a nonprofit organization, and you guys function off of donations. How can people get in contact with you if they want to sponsor some of the kids that you are mentoring and they want to help out? How can they get in contact with you? Well, they can go to, we have a website, uh, SIGSF.org. Also, you can go to my website, my, which is Malik, M-A-L-I-K, Wade, W-A-D-E, dot I-N-F-O. That, those two, that would be the easiest way to contact me in reference to supporting a young person for uh, who, who is involved with SIG or supporting any project that I have in my individual capacity as well. All right. Last but not least, how can they purchase your book? The book is available on my website, uh, which I just gave, but I'll give it again. Malik Wade, M-A-L-I-K, W-A-D-E dot I-N-F-O. Or you can purchase the book on Amazon, Barnes & Nobles, Kindle KDP, or the other, um, whatever e-teller that you choose to use. Do you have like an audio edition of your book? Are you working on it? Okay, he say he's working on it because that is another powerful uh, component. Like I told you, I think that a film of your story would do wonders, especially for this generation, uh, moving image is the most sought after form of media for this for this generation but make sure y'all go out y'all support this brother make sure y'all purchase his book and for those that are in a situation where they can financially help out we have to help this brother help his mentorship organization and get these young kids off of the streets now a lot of people put up GoFundMe pages, and we quick to support them. But this right here is a cause that is worthy of supporting. So make sure we go out and support. Malik, in closing, is there anything that you want to say that I forgot to ask you or any last closing words you want to leave our listenership with? Well, you can go to the, um, you can go to the Instagram page, which is uh, Malik Wade underscore SIG, where I post a lot of, I post a lot of good videos with me. I work the young, the young men I work with, I work them out physically, two or three times a week. So you can go to the Instagram page at Malik Wade underscore SIG, and you can also go to my Facebook page. Um, it's under my name, Malik Wade, and you can also go to uh, the Twitter page at Real Malik Wade. So. Um, Pretty much that's it. I really appreciate your time. I appreciate the listeners, and I appreciate you for taking out your time to uh, assist me with this endeavor, brother. Absolutely. That's what we do over here at Necessary Blackness Podcast. We try to raise the vibrational pitch of our people so that we can be that guiding and that shining light as we all seek freedom, justice, and equality. We are fighting for the liberation of the minds of African people, and we know that we are the holders of our responsibility, and we have to respond to our ability as a people, and we have to unify. So anything I can do or within my power. Now, we are about to go to a commercial break, and that was my interview with Malik Wade, and I will see you on the other side. Persons interested in broadcasting a commercial can reach us via email at necessaryblacknesspodcast at gmail.com. Necessary Blackness is distributed on all major podcast platforms iTunes, Stitcher, iHeart, SoundCloud, Podomatic, and Google Play. We'll also promote your business and product across our various social media networks, reaching over 100,000 people daily. Tune in for the drop. I am Dr. Kira Taylor, and when I'm tired of listening to fake news, I will listen to some real news, and I will check in to the Necessary Blackness podcast with my friend Raheem Shabazz. 
Ahim Shabazz is one of my guys from way back, and you're now listening to his show, Necessary Blackness Podcast. Stay tuned. This is a cool up cultivated roots media, and I choose to tune into Necessary Blackness because staying connected to my blackness is very necessary. Peace. This is Prince Culture Law, and I stay tuned into Necessary Blackness Podcast with Raheem Shabazz. Peace and power. This is reporting live, and you're tuned in to Necessary Blackness with my boy Raheem Shabazz. Yeah, this is Professor Ed Garns, founder of the wonderful From Afros to Shell Toes and Sweet Tea Ethics. When I am not spreading liberation theology throughout my classrooms as an African-centered therapist, I am chilling with my homie, Raheem Shabazz, on the Necessary Blackness Podcast. It's essential. Hey, what's going on, man? This is Arthur Emma Henry here. Whenever I want to get the latest on politics, social life issues facing our black community, I tune in to Necessary Blackness with Raheem Shabazz. This is Shali. When I'm not in the gym, I'm checking my son out on his podcast each and every Wednesday at 6 p.m. Make sure you check out Raheem Shabazz. Peace and blessings, beautiful people. This is your girl, Ashton Brianna. Just wanted to get out here and let you know that... Whatever you're doing, no matter where you are on Wednesday night, you can tune into Necessary Blackness, the podcast. Check us out on iTunes, Google Play, uh, where else? Anywhere. And you get to listen to me. So why not? Necessary Blackness, Wednesdays. Hey, guys, this is Ebony G of Having My Say Radio. When I'm not having my own say on my radio show every Monday from 9 to 11 p.m. on Love 860, I am tuned in to the Necessary Blackness podcast with Raheem Shabazz. This is Shot Town's finest, Khadidra. And when I'm relaxing, I enjoy listening to Necessary Blackness podcast with Raheem Shabazz. Yo, this is Cambino. And when I'm riding down Stony, all I listen to is Necessary Blackness podcast with my guy, Raheem Shabazz. Peace. This is Zaza Ali. And when I am not studying the science of the universe and the laws of creation, I am listening to the big homie Raheem Shabazz on Necessary Blackness. Make sure you support. Peace. Yo, that's what I'm talking about, man. You'll hear it here first. (laughs) Now our feature presentation. Peace and power, black family. This is your host, Raheem Shabazz, the Necessary Blackness Podcast. And I want to talk about a subject matter that many of you are familiar with and you need to understand the dynamics of it and the overall impact that it has on us as African people. And that's gentrification. Now, there is a neighborhood in Brooklyn particularly the Crown Heights neighborhood that has been in the news of lately. Now, in this neighborhood, there is a local bar slash restaurant that was scheduled to open called Summer Hill. Now, the owner of this restaurant decided to design the venue with bullet holes in the wall and a 40 ounce of malt liquor. And the community became outraged as they should. Many people are calling it culture appropriation, which I will not label it as that. For the simple fact is, bullet holes, violence, malt liquor is not a part of our culture. And what you have to understand, black people, is that there are certain white people that will use a so-called stereotype or a perceived stereotype and try to leverage it for profit while exploiting the community. And that's what exactly is being done. Now, if it wasn't for the community members and the outrage and going to their Yelp page and expressing that outrage, this venue would open. So the owner releases a press release after the initial press release, you know, describing the decor of the venue and how it would be good for the community. And in the initial press release, she said that the bullet holes was the remains from the last establishment, which turned out to be a lie. And when the backlash ensued, what she did was she decided to release an apology and said that she would be open to come into a community form that was scheduled from the community leaders and the community. She didn't show up. 
she actually released a, uh, another press release and saying how sorry she was. However, those that met at this community forum released what I will call a list of demands. And in the demands, they are calling for a verbal apology, a detailed business plan on how Summer Hill will incorporate local residents and people of color as employees at living wage or higher, and the removal of the bullet hole wall. And they want employee participation in community meetings and a whole bunch of other stuff. Now, l l let me explain what's wrong with that. You're always going to have those that feel that this is good for the community. We always hear that, that this is good for the community. It will bring jobs to the community. And they may even hire one or two people from the community. But what you don't realize is that the mindset of that owner that felt it was all right to open a venue with bullet holes and malt liquor as the decor for a restaurant and bar still exists. That racist mindset didn't go away. The bullet holes and the malt liquor, yeah, they'll take that away. But what about the mindset? How are they going to perceive the residents of that community? What we have to do, family, is that we have to buy the block. What the community should be doing at this community forum is pooling their resources together and see how they can buy that building and open up a business that the whole community could benefit from, that can be a business that is entrepreneurial in spirit that's going to teach the community members on how to successfully run a business. Because if there's a need for a restaurant, then there's a need for the people to establish that restaurant. We have to stop relying on other people to come in and provide jobs for our community. And what we also have to do is stop having these self-appointed leaders that don't speak on our behalf come and represent us. I don't know who is representing the residents of Crown Heights at this meeting, but evidently they're not doing a good job. A verbal apology is nothing. You're apologizing because of the uproar of the community. Hiring people from the community, that's not good in itself because the business owner is the owner of the business. The bulk of the money that is made is leaving the community and only several employees that probably reside in the community benefits from that. That doesn't benefit us as a whole. What we need to do is we need to establish long-term businesses that becomes institution and give and provide for the community. Now, I'm not going to go on a long rant about this. This is simple, cut to the point. You know what we have to do, family? We have to buy the block, and we have to continue to make sure that we support black businesses. My name is Raheem Shabazz. We out of here. You might not hear from us next week. We got a lot going on. As y'all know, we are in the final stages of putting out Elementary Genocide 3, Academic Holocaust. But I will be online. You can catch me on Facebook. You can catch me on Twitter. You can catch me on Instagram. Make sure you continue to send us your emails at Necessary Blackness podcast at gmail and anybody that's interested in advertising we have two spots that's open make sure you hit us up everyone hits us up after those spots are filled and they be filled for like three four months so make sure family that you hit us up in advance and if you don't already have elementary genocide one the school to prison pipeline elementary genocide two the board of education versus the board of incarceration make sure you go to elementarygenocide.com get you a copy and for those that want to get a copy of Elementary 3 in advance, you can now go on the website and pre-order it. 
We are getting a lot of orders. A lot of people still hitting us up, asking us when it come out. That means you're not going to the website. Don't wait till it come out. Get it in advance. Peace and power, black family. I'm out. See you in the whirlwind.